Life is a winding road No telling where it goes Driving through days and nights Won't stop for traffic lights And I I really wanna know, really wanna know If I Let me figure out where the road goes Even if I'm falling down I will keep on searching for my highs Say I lost my mind I will keep on holding my head high Even if the sky is falling down Jumping from cliffs so high Trusting our wings to fly Sometimes we're crashing down But we get up and start from the ground Searching for my highs You can say I lost my mind I will keep on holding my head high Even if the sky is falling down Welcome to Impact 100 Seattle's second annual meeting. My name is Anna Graves and I'm the co-founder and co-president of Impact 100 Seattle. We are so grateful for you, our members, and our friends who are here tonight. As you read in our opening, one of our 2020 grantee partners, Young Woman Empowered, is grateful for you as well. They told us, Thank you from the bottom of our hearts to know that we have partners like you that are championing us and sharing our mission with 100 women who will proudly share it with 100 others. It's a ripple, a major, major ripple. This is a year when we all started the ripple. As I look back and look forward, I believe that this ripple can turn into a wave a wave of hope and a wave of change with all of us as the force behind it. The beauty of a ripple is that it is easy to start. It takes just a drop. In our case, a drop of curiosity. 
As we learned together and sought out others to be our guides, our ripples started to grow. We solidified our vision and belief in trust-based philanthropy. We touched women who were veterans in the field, but have never thought of giving in a way that would redistribute power to those who didn't have it. They joined, helped spread the word, and our ripple grew. As new members joined and existing ones dove deeper, we started hearing about support beyond the $1,000 check they wrote. Some donated to our impact ship fund so more women with diverse backgrounds can become part of this journey and grow our ripple. Others worked with our grantee partners to make connections, support their events, and help them with additional resources. And then there were those who made donations of time and money to organizations they met along the way. Together, we made the ripple grow. Which brings us to tonight's event, during which we will hear from one of our grantee partners from last year and learn more about three small community-based organizations that are being recognized for the ripples they have made by touching the lives of individuals, communities, and working towards systems change. Now, I'd like to say something to our members. Each and every one of you, all 125, have made a contribution of $1,000 or have had that contribution made on your behalf. But this was just a drop that started your ripple. That $1,000 became three grants, one of $100,000 and two of $12,500. And your votes today will determine how these funds will be allocated among our three finalists. Now, less than 10% of grants in the Pacific Northwest are $1,000 or more. And although I don't have actual data, I would venture to say that just a small fraction of that goes to BIPOC-led, community-based organizations like our three finalists. But again, this is just a drop. Our ripple will grow as we build relationships with these three organizations and others that applied. It will grow as the women in this virtual room make connections and learn and bring others along. It will grow as we share our successes and failures with other organizations and continue to promote, tr promote trust-based philanthropy as the right way to give. It will grow and eventually turn into a wave, a wave of hope and change with all of us as the force pushing it forward. Thank you with all of our hearts for being a part of this force. I will now turn things over to Melissa West, who helped me turn my drop of curiosity into a ripple by teaching me and many others here tonight about trust-based philanthropy and ways in which we can shift the power and resources who do, to those who need it most. Melissa. Thank you, Anna. And it's so fun to be here um, with a few of my incredible Seattle, um, Impact 100 Seattle friends, um, both in person and virtually. I just, I love this group and Anna and Anne, I can't see you, but I know you're there. I'm grateful to both of you for bringing Impact 100 to Seattle and to your openness to a new way of grant making. Thank you. And I'm so inspired by the organizations you will hear about tonight. And I know that's why you are here too. But first, we thought it'd be helpful for you to learn a little bit about how we selected these three incredible organizations. After working with and for nonprofit organizations globally for 15 years, I've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly when it comes to grant making. And so much of philanthropy upholds racist power structures that we've been trying to um, get rid of. And while we're still adding drops to this wave of change, I'm so excited that this group of women is committed to a new narrative. And to help us stay the course, one of the first things that we did was develop a set of grant-making principles. 
The first is something that Anna just mentioned, and it's trust-based philanthropy, which provides us a model to challenge norms in philanthropy, including burdensome grant application processes and the strings that most funders attach to their funding. And I would argue that of those grants that Anna mentioned, the vast majority of those are restricted, which is very difficult when you're a nonprofit and you can't fund your executives or pay for your rent because all of the funding has to go to programs. The second thing that we have built into our principles is the desire to support transformative change. And that's really focusing on the long windy path to altering systems and addressing the root causes of social issues that are facing people in the Puget Sound region. The third, embrace risk. The field of philanthropy is incredibly risk averse. We strive to reward and encourage new ways of thinking and challenge some of the unhelpful myths about how organizations that are too small or too new or not led by the right person, um, we believe that those people can make big change. Those organizations, organizations can make big change and we wanna support them. And the fourth, fourth is listen, learn and evolve. We are bringing women together and supporting a learning journey as we learn from each other and from all of the organizations with whom we're working. We've made mistakes and we're going to continue to make them. And we hope that all of you will help hold us accountable in that journey. Now that we've covered the principles, very briefly, we'll talk about the process that 23 members of the grant review team helped us to refine and make possible this year. I personally believe that one of the most egregious practices in philanthropy is the 5% payout require, requirement, meaning that the vast majority of funding sits in the bank where it can't be put to work for communities. So we decided to do things differently. And I'll have to tell you that Impact 100 Seattle is crushing it when it comes to getting money out the door quickly. We went from the application deadline of April 4th to um, organizations getting checks in less than 60 days. And just a few notes on our process. Um, one of them is that we had all of the members of the grant review team, and hopefully they're identified by their background so you can see who they all are. But we had them participate in a mandatory bias training to help remind us of all the different types of bias uh, and help us recognize it when it shows up because we know it does. And one of the other things that we have strived to do as the 23 of us met over the course of the last few weeks is really to try to drive toward consensus. And it wasn't easy. This was an incredibly tough task when you have 57 applicants and only three finalists. But we put a lot of hard work into this process and we did deep dives into seven semifinalists to get to the three finalists that you'll meet to today. Um, and I know you're all anxious to get there. So I'm gonna continue and go to um, just a, a bit about the criteria that we use to identify those three finalists. So we modified our criteria this year, reducing the ceiling on revenue for applicants to $2 million, so smaller organizations than we'd worked with in the past. We also ensured that fiscally sponsored organizations were eligible. These organizations may be too small or too early in their um, work or they may need to work with another organization to support them and probably don't have their own 501c3 status. That was actually a mistake we made last year that we corrected for this year. That was one of our principles, the, the learning and evolving. But to get to three finalists from 57 applicants, we simplified what we were looking for to three core things. And we wrestled with how each applicant measured up. This was not scientific. There were many organizations that were incredibly worthy of our resources. In fact, all of them are. And we hope that you will support many that you will not see tonight and we'll be sharing ways to do that later. But in order to narrow down to these three incredible organizations, we were looking at one, to what extent they were community centered. To us, that means that they raise issues and develop strategies to address those issues from lived experience. We identified organization organizations whose staff, leadership, board, volunteers reflect and or maintain close proximity to the communities they serve, embracing their voices and their experiences to provide input into their programs and services. 
The second thing we looked at was identifying organizations working toward transformative change. While all the organizations are transforming lives, families, we sought organizations who were addressing the root cause of an issue. You can see this graphic that I like that talks about the, the roots instead of just the leaves of the tree. We want to interrupt the status quo. And we believe that Impact 100 Seattle is about interrupting the status quo. So sometimes that means attempting to change power or structures, policy or legislation. And it always includes collaboration with others. And finally, we looked at how organizations are serving their underserved populations. So we were trying to determine that the organizations had a very clear sense of the population they were serving and that they aligned their programs to reduce the inequities among those populations. Each of our three finalists excelled in all of these. And now I would like to introduce Jennifer Larson, Impact 100 Seattle Vice President, a philanthropist, a wonder mom, and one of the kindest people I've ever met. She has provided a steady hand in leading the grant review team, and she'll be sharing more about the three finalists. Thanks, Melissa. That was a wonderful introduction. Um, and I'm humbled to be here tonight to introduce each of our grantee partners um, and to tell you a little bit more about them as we uh, lead up to the vote. So our first grantee partner is the Duwamish River Cleanup Coalition. The DRCC's mission is to advocate for clean, healthy, equitable environments for people and wildlife. They empower the community around the Duwamish River through programming and community events. They promote place, place keeping, ensuring the preservation of cultural identities they transform the river, community, and sense of home and place. Community served. The DRCC serves 25,000 residents and the environment in South Seattle. Its population is marked by high poverty and low life expectancy. The population is 42% foreign born, 40% Latino, many undocumented, and 70% people of color. In addition to being the third most polluted river in the nation, it is an EPA Superfund toxic hazardous waste site. The area is surrounded by state highways, airports, and commercial rail lines. These factors combine to produce significant health, public safety, and economic inequities that require a holistic community-based, systems-based approach to repair. Programs. The DRCC draws links between longstanding health, economic, and environmental issues, as well as gentrification, displacement, and climate change. Their programs include the Healthy Home Initiative, an air program which partners with the American Lung Association to evaluate factors leading to poor indoor air quality in Duwamish Valley residents' homes. This program expands employment opportunities and helps other organizations invest economically in the Duwamish Valley. The Duwamish Valley Affordable Housing Coalition is organizing and mobilizing vulnerable community members to prevent displacement. The Duwamish Valley Youth Corps is the only area youth engagement program focusing on environmental justice, mentorship, and job skills for youth over ages 13. The youth work on hands-on projects and gain communication and leadership skills. The Maritime High School. The maritime industry is the third largest economic driver in the state with a workforce that's retiring. So DRCC will help prepare students from the community with experiential learning based on research in both classrooms and on the river. And lastly, the Community Stewards Program engages community members and facilitates training in stewardship and non-native plant identification and removal. Transformative change. DRCC has been tackling the health inequity linked to environmental pollution by advocating for issues such as cumulative approach to environmental monitoring and holding city, state, and federal agencies accountable for legislative injustices on issues from health to displacement, to investment. The organization is also working for stronger regulations of key industries along the river, such as recycling, transport, and iron and metal. 
community-centered. Most of the DRCC staff, volunteers, and board are all residents or deeply linked within the Duwamish Valley. DRCC prioritizes equity and accessibility to provide a voice to community members, many of whom have been unheard and underrepresented for decades. They hire from within the community, they open pathways between policymakers and residents, and in every way possible, they elevate community voices. An unrestricted grant would help DRCC comp complete its transition from an environmental organization to one with a more expansive view that is better able to holistically tackle the intersectional issues of climate, racial, and social justice. The Duwamish Valley, the, sorry, the Duwamish River Cleanup Coalition represents an alliance of residential, tribal, environmental, and small business groups affected by ongoing pollution and cleanup of Seattle's Duwamish River. Its vision is an empowered Duwamish Valley community thriving in a healthy and just environment. They manage a holistic approach to improving life for people, animals, and climate along Seattle's only river, while unflinchingly centered on community, making it relevant now and in the future. And here is a video that we got a chance to speak with the, um, the Duwamish River Cleanup Coalition. We're excited to share it with you today. My name is Paulina Lopez. The Duwamish River Cleanup Coalition was created when the river was declared a Superfund site. Since then, we have been operating in a way that we wanted to make sure we center the voices of the people who are impacted by the Duwamish River pollution, making sure they are the ones designing the future of the river, giving empowerment to the youth, eliminating air pollution, as well as um, addressing better uh, green spaces, really. A story that always comes to mind was first the creation of our Duwamish Valley Youth Corps program which was in response to the community coming to us saying there is a big amount of youth in the neighborhood and there isn't a lot of opportunities for them. We also had a history of gang involvement in the neighborhood, so we needed to address that as an organization. And, and since then, we have been able to address this priority of giving youth positive engagement with the community, creating this ownership with themselves. We have been working very hard with community for the past decade, giving the power to the people to make sure those who are responsible for the pollution, those who are responsible to make laws, they are kept accountable. You know, for unrestricted funds for organizations like ours really go far. When we have funds for specific projects is very important, but it's bringing additional capacity and burden sometimes to community because you have to deliver on, on projects. Whereas an unrestricted funds leave, lets you really, for organizations like ours, address root causes in the organization, but also within our own network and how can we be moving more efficiently as an organization, being healthier, sustainable, and at the same time creating that structure that you need to be able to respond to community, which ultimately is our mission to be guided by those voices. We want to be led by youth voices, by, by the, the power and by um, our youth uh, participation in our organization. We are in the middle of designing how could this look like and we have called already some of our youth participants. We will be taking their leadership and their wisdom to be moving forward our strategic planning and our climate platform because youth need to be leading the way on climate. What a wonderful video. Um, our next group, our next grantee partner is the Goodfoot Arts Collective. The Goodfoot Arts Collective mission is to provide youth violence prevention adv uh, uh, advocacy through arts education. They envision youth of marginalized communities equipped to end violence before it begins, expressive in the arts through transformative movement and artistic mediums, empowered to reach their full potential through mentorship and educated to ad advocate in their community. Community served. The Goodfoots Arts Collective serves South Seattle and is currently delivering curriculum at Franklin and Rainier Beach High Schools. They serve 800 ninth graders 
with violence prevention and arts education curriculum through school partnerships and a thousand community members through community events and dance competitions. Before COVID, they served 75 to 100 dancers in classes and after school open sessions. Their programs. Goodfoot has several programs that are serving the community. Their CLAY, Creative Leaders Affirming Youth Program, is a healthy relationship, social emotional support, and youth violence prevention curriculum utilizing healing centered engagement. The program is delivered in high schools. They also offer classes, events, and other community engagement initiatives. Recently, the organization launched a No Excuses campaign that broadens the reach of their anti-violence work with an annual over 400 person jam event and music and dance programming. This platform calls attention to youth violence prevention on a larger scale beyond the classroom curriculum. Transformative change. Through teaching youth skills for healthy relationships and violence prevention, the Good Foot is empowering people to live safer, happier lives with impacts on their families and communities. More broadly, they are addressing and working to disrupt toxic mainstream hip hop and b-boy culture that perpetuates violence against women and promotes hypersexuality. They are community centered. Goodfoot maintains close proximity to the community. The staff and leadership of Goodfoot is composed of BIPOC domestic violence professionals and dancers and artists. The organization is led by individuals who have lived experience with domestic violence and toxic relationships. Several of their adult facility facilitators went through the curriculum as youth. Grant, this is a pivotal moment for Goodfoot and a 2021 grant from Impact 100 would be transformational. The main use would be to fund staffing for a program assistant and development a a director, which would allow them to expand their reach and increase individual donors. They are also planning a capital campaign for a permanent space to host dance and music classes, after school programs, and organic impromptu dance and jam sessions. The Goodfoot Arts Collective is a grassroots organization emerging out of the co-founders understanding and healing of their own toxic relationship and others they saw within the hip hop community. For 15 years, May Presuth, one of the co-founders, along with many artists and community members, grew the organization organically, working integrally with schools and community centers to bring their anti-violence curriculum to high school students. With hip hop as the modality and entry point for building trusting relationships with students, they've been able to have real and sustained impact, advocating for safety and empowering youth to build an environment of no tolerance for violence, sexual misconduct, toxic behavior, and abuse. May is a passionate leader with a broad vision, as well as practical skills to grow the organization to the next level. And here's the Goodfoot Arts Collective video. My name is May Presuth. I'm the executive director and co-founder of the Goodfoot Arts Collective in South Seattle. The Goodfoot Arts Collective mission is youth violence prevention through arts education. Um, And our vision is to see youth of color equipped to end violence before it begins, um, expressive in the arts through transformative movement and artistic mediums, empowered um, to reach their full potential through mentorship, um, and educated to advocate in their community. I am that young woman who felt misplaced in her own community as a woman of color, as an artist, as a dancer in the hip hop community and unpacking my own misogynistic culture and the views and the sexual assault and trauma that I face in intimate partner violence. I am a wounded healer. And the only reason why we're doing so much of the work that we do is because we have gone through it. Hi, my name is Consali and I'm one of the Goodfoot interns. I remember being so lost. I had these feelings and emotions I did not understand. At the time, I didn't understand that I was being abused. At eight years old, you shouldn't know what abuse is. Your childhood should be filled with love and enjoyment, but too often that is not the case. Too many times I've sat on the kitchen floor holding a knife to my throat or pills in my hands, wanting to give up. 
I had no one to talk to. I didn't know how to get help. And ultimately, I thought I was the only one going through this. And one day, my teacher told us she knew a few people, and they would be coming into the classroom to teach a few lessons. These people came out to be the good foot. These lessons are life-changing. Every lesson, I was able to walk out of the classroom and reflect on my own reality. They taught me that I am not my abuser, that I have control over my life. I sit here today not having one suicidal thought in four years with aspirations to become a DV advocate, a suicide preventionist, and facilitate the thin curriculum that saved my life. Funding would truly help us expand our staff capacity. We want to raise up young leaders as credible messengers who, can we, who we can pay well and help with their professional development so that they can carry on careers that would be lasting and impactful in their own backyard. We can imagine a world where violence will not exist and that we won't even have our jobs. We love the work that we do, but if we can imagine a place where organizations like us don't exist, that is the goal and that is the end passion that we truly seek to desire in our community. And our third grantee partner is Feast. Feast's mission is to set the table for young people to transform the health and equity of their community by gathering around food and working towards systems change. Feast Community Serves. They serve low-income, refugee, immigrant, BIPOC youth in South King County with programs in Chief Self, Evergreen, Rainier Beach, and Taiyi High Schools. Each year, Feast works directly with 32 fellows, eight per school, who organize weekly programs which attract 25 to 100 students. Through these fellowships and programs, the program directly affects around 500 students each year. Changes to food offerings and choices are district-wide, having an impact on 18,000 students in the Highline District and 50,000 in the Seattle School District. At the core of these programs is the Youth Leadership Development Program which recruits youth leaders to develop their organizing and leadership skills in an effort to help them advocate for healthy, culturally relevant, free food access for all students. These youth become ambassadors to their schools and invite other students to community gatherings. Pre-COVID, these events were dinners where students made and shared food that was fresh, nutritious, and culturally relevant. During these meals, youth learn and develop campaign agendas for the group. Pre-COVID, they piloted a free healthy snack program. During COVID, they have delivered groceries and food cards to families of kids in the schools they serve. They have also increased their mental health curriculum and refocused on discussing broader social justice issues with their youth. Transformative change. Each year, youth fellows learn advocacy skills and discuss food equity, as well as other issues that impact their communities. These youth become leaders who have an immediate impact on their communities. This impact has a ripple effect that affects layers of people from inner circles working outwards to the system levels. Developing advocacy agendas of people from uh, let's see, developing advocacy agendas with the youth leaders has made it clear that social justice beyond food equity is on their minds. This past year, Feast Youth Leaders successfully joined with other organizations to develop a petition to stop SPD involvement in Seattle public schools. This is one example of systems change. Long-term, Feast has a goal of introducing scratch-cooked, culturally relevant, and free food to all Seattle schools. Community-centered. FEAST is a Black-led organization with a staff, youth leaders, and the great majority of the board identifying as BIPOC and a strong LGBTQ leadership. FEAST organizers share similar lived experiences as the youth they serve, and many volunteers are former youth leaders. FEAST advocacy agenda is set by the youth leaders. Surveys and outreach ensure that the programs they are implementing are meeting their goals. An Impact 100 grant. As FEAST plans for the next stage, there is a lot of demand for them to expand beyond the four high schools they currently work in. 
and 100,000 would enable them to pay for two additional organizers to expand. They are also looking for organizers to help beyond youth and address and organize their parents as well in order to be able to affect policies at a higher level, district, or even state. FEAST is a community-based and community-run organization that embodies Impact 100 grant criteria. They reduce inequities by addressing food equity in schools while working towards system change and building leadership in underserved communities. They build power where it doesn't exist in low-income BIPOC youth by educating them on how to organize and advocate for social justice within food equity and beyond. Hi, I'm Jemaine Marsh and I'm the Executive Director of FEAST and I use they, them pronouns. FEAST stands for Food Empowerment Education and Sustainability Team. We build power with low-income youth of color and immigrant and refugee youth. Our mission is to set the table for young people to transform their schools by gathering around food and working towards systems change. In the summer of 2020, we partnered with Washington Building Leaders of Change and Black Minds Matter, a student group from Rainier Beach, to create a petition where we received over 20,000 signatures in support of the youth's demand to remove police officers from their schools. Over time, through our ongoing work with the school district, particularly the school district nutritionists, we've gained many more scratch-cooked items on the menu, some of them created by Feast Youth. We've given our commitment to supporting with a food truck that can help deliver fresh, healthy meals that are also culturally relevant all around the city. And we've received support for our power mapping to be able to work effectively with other decision makers from director Brandon Hersey. Hi, my name is Celia Jurdy. I am the development director here at FEAST. FEAST is truly a, uh, an organization that is led by and for the people that it serves. And in this case, that is youth of color. Our youth are involved at all levels of our organization. We have four FEAST alumni on our board and staff right now. More power comes from having more people. That is more staff on our team. That is more intergenerational allies, including parents and teachers, folks who have the power to vote, and support we would need from the folks who would be implementing these changes. So in thinking of school food, the cafeteria workers. The second critical need for funding we have is youth stipends. So we ensure that our youth are compensated for their participation in our program. This makes our program more accessible to people from all backgrounds. We believe that in organizing, the people who are most impacted by an issue should be at the center of the solution making. So it's important that we lift up youth leaders as the decision makers and as the best people to formulate solutions that work best for their lives. Wow. Well, thank you, Jennifer and Melissa, and thank you to the three finalists for the work that they do every day. Um, I was recently talking to a friend of mine and a member named Lisa. Um, she told me she was so inspired to learn about the transformational work done by our finalists, and she was really stunned that she knew nothing about them. She said, uh, they are small, so they fly under the radar. But this, this is the work we should be supporting. Lisa, I couldn't agree more. And I hope you're even more inspired now after hearing from them. We're now going to ask you to open up the voting email you received with your unique code and link to vote. The ballot will ask you to tell us which of these three organizations you would like to support with a $100,000 unrestricted grant. The other finalists will receive a meaningful unrestricted, unrestricted grant of $12,500. We know this is not an easy choice, and we look forward to getting to know all three of these organizations, hoping that we can spread the word about them, support them with time, connections, and in turn, help grow the ripple they are creating in their communities. We will give everyone around three minutes to place their votes, and we'll run a video with some member reflections while you vote. If you are not finished with the vote by the time the video is over, please send a note to myself uh, in the chat. We want to make sure that everyone has a chance to make their vote.
Hi, my name is Katrina Russell, and I am co-chair of the Impact 100 Grantee Partner Nonprofit Organization or, or Committee. Excuse me. Um, I am so pleased to share to the stage tonight uh, with one of our Grantee Partner Award winners last year, uh, Community Passageways. Tonight we have Marianne Wong, the Director of Development, and Dominique Davis, the Founder, President, and CEO of Community Passageways. And Dominique has agreed to kind of give us an update as to how the organization has been doing. So let me start by welcome, welcoming Dom. How are you this evening? I'm fine. I'm fine. Thank you for having me. Um, I appreciate all that you guys are doing. Um, I want to just start off by saying um, the support you guys have been able to give us and other organizations around the community have been awesome. I love the way you guys are doing um, your, uh, your giving because it's, it, it's not hard to do. It doesn't have a bunch of barriers and red tape. And I just really appreciate that. And I appreciate you guys honoring small-based, community-based organizations that have their sleeves up doing the work in the community and you guys are rolling up your sleeves and partnering with these organizations and i just really respect it and i'm honored to be in space with you guys um uh, the update um, i'm gonna do this in about eight minutes i'm gonna talk fast so put on your seatbelt. <laughs> i'm gonna try to put up pack a lot in eight minutes um community passageways we're a felony diversion program um gang prevention intervention um school programming culturally relevant school programming and curriculum um, um, uh, uh, re-entry, outreach, uh, rental assistance, uh, getting people sit, uh, all the basic needs met, it's just on and on and on. We job placement, housing, we do everything. So there's a whole lot of things we do, but I'm gonna give you a couple of stories real quick of, of what we've been doing this past year. Uh, one of the things we did was we were able to um, meet some needs in the community to address gun violence. Gun violence has skyrocketed in our community and Community Passageway says we want to do something about it. And so what we did was we, we get, uh, partnered with a couple of other organizations and we created these safety hubs, community safety hubs, in each hot spot around the city of Seattle. And we put one in West Seattle, one in the Central District, one in South Seattle. And we have these hot spots where we, and we hired teams of people and took them through training, intense training, and we placed them in these different hubs to, to work in these areas to try to um, be de-escalators and react to situations at the beginning, not react at the end. So when I say react at the beginning, that means go out and tap the shoulders of these young people that are in the community, that are in these gangs, involved in these shootings, that are carrying these guns, because the people that we hired are the people that were connected to these communities. They know the young people that are doing the shootings. A lot of them are OGs that, that came out of the gangs. A lot of them are, are some of them are even young guys that say, I want to get out. And, and we gave them a way out by giving them a good paying job, a healthcare package, the training they need, the resources they need to go tap their homies and the people they were in the streets with and say, man, I got something for you. I got a job for you. I get you housing. I get you back in school. We can do whatever we need to do for you. So we, we were able to launch that. And when we launched it, it was a, it's, so far we've been, it's been pretty powerful. It's been pretty big. Um, it's been something to, to the point where um, I'm really proud of it. Because not only is it helping our community, but it's also helping the people that do the work in the community to, to go down the right road, stay on the right track. And they see themselves in a positive light, being those heroes in the community now, instead of being a detriment in the community, somebody that's out helping. And so that's one of the things I'm, I'm, I'm proud of because it's part of our expansion and our growth. This picture behind me is our deep dive program. Our deep dive program is something that we uh, started a year ago, a little bit, about a year and a half ago. And a deep dive program is to go after the highest um, I, I'll say that the most volatile young people in the community that are um, rated to be able to be uh, in, a, uh, in a percentage of a percentile to shoot or be shot in a short period of time, 12 to 18 months is what they say. And they're on a, li a lot of these net kids were on a list for the prosecuting attorney's office and, and the algorithm of their shots fire program shows these young people's names to be um, in the position to be shot or shoot somebody in a short period of time. So I said, well, I can't let you guys just have this list and sit back and wait for somebody to get shot or shoot somebody or try to build a case on them. Give me the list and I'm gonna get my teams, I'm gonna hire people to go out and we're gonna go find them. We want their latest address and their latest contact numbers. And most of my team are people from the community anyway. We knew most of the names anyway. We knew how to find most of them anyway. And some names that should have been on that list weren't on that list. So we went out and got them too. 
and we were able to pull them into the deep dive program. This is the first cohort that you're looking at. Out of 25 or so young people, we've gotten 16 of them full-time jobs. We've gotten about eight to 12 of them, uh, uh, maybe even 13 at this point, um, uh, in their own apartments with jobs. We've been able to get three of them to graduate high school on time. One of them just graduated up this past weekend and, we're, and they're on their way to uh, college soon. They, you know, they're on their way to college. Um, where I'm at right now with the deep dive program is we just lost one of the young men in this picture. Um, he was one of the superstars, changing his life. He was one of the real heavy hitters. He was a leader of one of his gang set, of the gang he was in. And we were, he was changing his life, doing the right thing, got him a full-time job, got him an apartment. He got married, he had a baby, he was doing the right thing. He went back down on his hood to talk to some of his homeboys and talk to some of the guys that he wasn't really cool with to try to get, get out of him about some things and try to get them to come, you know, get, stop the violence a little bit. And an argument ensued, uh, ensued and he just got shot and killed a couple of weeks ago. And so we lost him. And I was just getting ready to hire him full time on the community passageways. But what's so crazy about it is three of the people in this picture that were supposed to be high risk, high level, you know, in the games, I hired him. I got one a full-time job at another place, another two I hired. Like these guys are doing great work. Now they're in the community doing the work that we pulled them in to do with them. It's, it's amazing to see what you can do when you tap into the potentials of these young people. They're not all gang members, they're not all throwaways, they're not all people we shake their heads at and say that they're bad. No, you give them an opportunity, their brilliance will shine. This is what Community Passageways is all about, tapping into the brilliance. The growth that we've had, doing the work that we do, and felony diversion, um, it's been crazy because we've been able to divert over 350 years of prison and jail time off the table for young people in the community and, and young adults. We work with people up to 27 years old, people that are facing felony crimes. We get them a job, we get them housing, we get them in school, we give them support, we get them into programming. They're doing work in the community. They're on panels, they're speaking, they're on, on steering committees and all this stuff. They're doing all these things. And, and the prosecutors, uh, we're able to mitigate charges with them and make deals with them or go to sentencing and present to them, like, here's all the things. We, we provided pictures and videos. We provide reports. We've had judges just say, you know what? I'm not locking this kid up. We're going to put this kid on probation. Or we're just going to put this young person on probation because of the work we've been able to do with them. We've been very successful for a small organization, but our small organization has expanded and started growing. Now we're close to 60 employees now at Community Passageways, when it was just a handful of us a couple of years ago. Now I, I am... I'm, I, I'm in a space where I could say um, that the future looks very bright for community passageways because I see us as being an alternative. No, no, no I take that back. No longer being an alternative to the criminal justice system I, or, or even gang intervention or prevention. I see us being the go-to. I see judges, prosecutors looking at us and saying, instead of locking this person up, let's give them an opportunity to go work in the community with this community-based organization. Let's give them an opportunity to get a job and get housing and get in school and get, have mentorship and go through programming and, and develop a different way of thinking. All they need is opportunity. They see people that look like them, that have been down the same roads they've been, and they see us being able to change our lives and then be an example for them and have the resources to change their lives. And that's what I see us being. You guys have been a huge impact on us. <laughs> impact. See how I did that? You guys are a huge you guys have been able to be a huge impact on us because the support that you give us, the support that you guys have been given, not only is it inspiring and inspirational for me as the CEO and founder of the organization to have people support the work we do, because a lot of the work we do stays under the shadows or else it comes and says, hey, uh, you guys are out here in, in the middle of the streets and two people just died the other day. Well, you know, we can't stop everything, but we but you can't count the stuff we have been able to stop, right? There's no, you can't keep data on what didn't happen, right? And when you have hundreds of young people that have been in gangs and in the streets or was failing out of school and all stuff, and they're saying, thank you for saving my life. I know I'd be in prison and jail right now. They call us big bro. They call us uncle. We're at their kids' birthday parties and at their, their, their mom's birthday parties and at the barbecues at their houses. And, and we're, at the, we're at baby showers. I'm tired of going to baby showers. And you know how many graduations I've had to go to in the last few weeks? I'm tired of them, but, we, but we're part of the family. It's, it's incredible. We, we created a new village and it's our village and, and, we, and it takes a village to raise these young people. And we've created that for these young people. So the money that you guys gave us went to really good use because we were able to supply basic needs, support these young people, put stipends in their pockets, put food in their mouths, um, get them gas, get them transportation, 
catch Ubers to the to different things they need, get job close for job interviews. I can just go down the list. I'm gonna wrap up by saying thank you. Thank you for your support. We need more support because we're growing. So I, I hope you guys are ready to support us even more because the bigger we get, the more support we're gonna get, the more lives we can change, and the more we're gonna need you guys to have our backs. So I appreciate all you guys. Thank you. Oh, Dom, thank you so much. You have been an incredible partner. You've shared your time, which we know you are incredibly busy with all the work that you do, but several times throughout the year, you've participated in these kinds of events with our membership. And the work you do is incredibly awesome and just so inspiring. So thank you, thank you, and please keep it up. <laughs> I think Tom was saying something else, but he was on mute. But um, I will reflect what Katrina says, yes. And just thank you so much, Dom. And I hope you had a chance to read all of the messages in the chat. What an inspiring organization. Thank you um, for being our partner. So my name is Ann Janda, and I am the co-president and co-founder of Impact 100 Seattle. Um, and like I said, Dom has done a wonderful job of supporting our community. And of course, we cannot con continue to support our community without the support of you, our members. And I hope that all of the women listening tonight will consider renewing their membership for 2022 or joining us for the first time. We hope that we can continue to grow the impact in our community. So if you're ready to join or renew, we'd love for you to do it now. You will have the flexibility to pay your membership now over time or fully in the spring of 2022 before we grant our next $100,000 or more unrestricted grant. You will see a link to join or renew in our chat. We also want to ensure that as we emerge from this crazy year of isolation, that we provide opportunities for you, our members, to get to know each other, connect, learn, and laugh, not only online, but in person as well. So take a look at some of the upcoming events that we hope you can all take part in. Our book club is always looking for new members. And if you can't make this upcoming discussion, you can join us for the next one coming in late summer. And this summer, please join us for one of our outdoor happy hours hosted by some of our members and stay tuned for more in-person and virtual events in the fall. You will always find all event information and registration links in our monthly member emails or on our website under events, so check it often. And if you want to get more involved with an Impact 100 committee, because as you know, we're 100% volunteer run, um, simply message me and I can connect you to the right people and find something that you are passionate about doing for our organization. Finally, before we announce the voting results, I want to tell you one more story of how our ripple grew beyond where I could have imagined. The videos you viewed tonight were, were created by Avery, a young man from Renton who just graduated from the cinematography program at Seattle Central College. He spent last Thursday, that's right, they were just created. He spent last Thursday getting to know our finalists, hearing their stories and documenting them. As he was leaving the first organization, the executive director asked him if he would come and speak to the youth they work with. She wanted them to hear from a young person that shares their background. She wanted them to see that it is possible to succeed and live your dreams. At the end of the day, Avery chatted about wanting to do more documentary work, seeing the needs in the community, and wanting to spread their word. He realized that he too had the power to grow the ripple of these inspiring organizations. So with that, I will hand it back over to the team at Anna's. <laughs> thank you, Anne. Um, and thank you, everyone, for being here today. Thank you, Dom. Um, you're always inspiring, and it is just uh, so wonderful to be here. Um, I think that we've probably held the suspense for long enough. Um, I do want to say that if you were anything like me, um, you had a really hard time voting. I think that um, it is um, 
it is a testament to really the process and the people that volunteered to be on the grant review committee, just how amazing these three organizations were um, and are. And the work that they're doing, we know that we want to support all three of them um, and really the five from last year as well. So we have a growing number of organizations that we want to support beyond the check um, as well as with a check. And so now um, I'd like to announce um, that the recipient of our $100,000 unrestricted grant is the Duwamish River uh, Coalition. Yay! Yay. <laughs> um, we are also extremely excited um, to provide a $12,500 grant to Feast and the Good Food Arts Collective. Uh, we will call all three organizations tomorrow morning to present them with these grants, and we will record their reactions to share with all of you, as I'm sure you would love to see um, their excitement. <laughs> so now um, we are pretty much running right on time. Um, I want to thank you for being here with us tonight. Um, and we'd like to make a toast um, to our members, our grantee partners, and our friends. So as we gather all of, all of us, oh, there we go. Ah, oh, you can't even see us, hold on. <laughs> okay, let's stop share, hold on. For the, uh, and let's do um, no virtual background. Here we go, okay. Now you can see us all, there we go. So. Here is to the many ripples we've made tonight. May they keep growing and eventually turn into giant waves that will flood our community with hope and positive change. Cheers. 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 Here, here. Feel free to unmute yourself and cheers to everyone. Cheers. Thank you, everyone. Well done. Cheers. Great nice meeting. Thank you. And now uh, we, will, we will offer everyone breakout rooms if you want to stick around and chat a little bit. We do also have one other short video to share. Um, and this tells you what um, the Duwamish River Coalition um, would actually, will actually do with um, the $100,000. Um, and so I want to share that with you right now. No, you're good. I don't, it's good. Wow, uh, just a second. Sorry about the delay. Here we go. All right. A hundred thousand dollars really can get very far in our organization, uh, especially if they're unrestricted. Um, as I mentioned uh, before, you know, like bringing that uh, strategic planning into our organization, it's going to be a big difference in how we are addressing one, the community priorities, but also how are we addressing vitality in the organization. Um, also, it would allow us to keep our financials, financials in place, creating the right systems to track them, creating a, a good way of bringing the operational parts of our organization that in order for us to be good outside, we need to be good in the inside as every concept that applies in life. So we need to look at ourselves um, as an organization uh, continue deeply engaging our coalition members, the Duwamish tribe, the Puget Sound Keeper Alliance, the uh, front and center, and bring all of them to be um, serving uh, the community that we are here in the Duwamish Valley into the ways that make sense to them. And so we need those um, unrestricted funds and $1,000 to get us very far in engaging $100,000 in engaging community, but also uh, giving the places that we need uh, in order for community to participate in the processes, as well as uh, bringing the capacity internally that the organization needs in order to function sustainably. Won't stop for traffic lights And I I really want to know, really want to know If I Let me figure out where the road goes Even if I'm falling down I will keep on searching for my highs Say I lost my mind, I will keep on holding my head high Even if the sky is falling down Jumping from cliffs
lift so high Trust in our wings to fly Sometimes we're crashing down But we get up and start from the ground Searching for my highs You can say I lost my mind I will keep on holding my head high Even if the sky is falling down Traffic lights 